was interesting because in early February, I remember seeing Chinese state-run media coming up with the spin that was basically China is saving the rest of the world by right. keeping the virus contained inside China. And this is before the U.S. got a lot of cases or I think Italy had already been hit. But generally, it wasn't that bad where it had spread to a lot of countries. And their propaganda line at the time was, we are sacrifi- we're nobly sacrificing ourselves for the betterment of the world. Yeah, I remember that. I wonder if those articles are still online. Right. So you can see how sort of the early propaganda lines, the early responses to this thing don't line up with what was actually going on at the time. And, you know, for myself, uh, looking at it in terms of just the air travel, right, I said, well, you, you haven't stopped any flights at all. And you could look into the data and you would see flights going from China from all all sorts of cities in China, um, on those international airports, they never stopped. They never once stopped until other countries banned them and other countries put on these travel restrictions. It was not something that was led by the PRC ever. One of the things you mentioned earlier in the podcast is about the Chinese Communist Party's uh, historical narrative and the rewriting of history. And so what it seems like the Chinese regime is trying to do now is rewrite the history of COVID-19. And we'll see it for a few more years, probably a few a few further changes to the narrative. And then they will sort of look back on it as, you know, whatever, whatever their new narrative becomes, obviously it will be something that's not their fault. And they're going to push this new revised historical narrative on everybody else to try to like prevent uh, a kind of true reflection uh, or, you know, prevent scientists and journalists from ever really having the full picture of what happened. Oh, you see this already early on where when I'm talking about uh, Sher Zhang Li and uh, Dr. Daniel Anderson or Peter Daszak or any of these people who are, inst- who are associated with the Wuhan Institute, they say, well, we caused this. We were the ones who are saving the world. We were saving all of humanity. That's why we did all these experiments. That's why we're conducting it. And you can go back, by the way, and look at the rationale for why are we conducting gain of function? Dr. Fauci himself uh, has a quote talking about this, saying, well, the benefit outweighs the risk because we will then get the next jump. We will be ahead of the next pandemic. We are the ones who will be in charge, who will have the playbook on the shelf to be ready when the next pandemic hits. The pandemic hit, guys, and I don't remember the Wuhan Institute or the NIH or Peter Daszak or Daniel Anderson or any of these people stepping forward and say, hey, we've seen something like this before. We've seen this in the lab. Here's a treatment for it. Here's how to help. Here's how it affected uh, humanized mice, right? You never once saw anyone talking about this stuff or admitting that all of this was going on until we were going through their documents that they tried to hide and brought up all of these questions. We wouldn't even know that they were conducting these experiments because they themselves were not forthcoming about it in the early days of it. So they've been trying to puff themselves up and paint them as the saviors of humanity and um, the, you know, the defenders of the human race against this, 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 this vile virus. And that's the way Xi Jinping is positioning himself. That's the way you're now seeing Chinese academics positions the party. Uh, there was this professor from Fudan University who gave a speech back in April, you know, talking about this. He's saying, well, you know, you have to look at U.S. decline and all the way from 9-11 to the financial crisis to the coronavirus uh, crisis. You know, the U.S. has just been taken down and taken down and taken down. And suddenly, you know, and it's and it's it's very sad. But of course, China is now able here to, you know, we don't want to. We don't want to be number one. We, we, we would hate to have to do that. We don't want to knock the U.S. down. But it seems that the U.S. is declining all by itself. And so China must now assume the mantle, assume this role of the global hegemon, assume this role of protecting international trade, protecting international affairs. We don't want to, by the way. We just have to because of the vacuum that's left by the United States. So you're already starting to see this narrative be formed. And the CCP are masters of information warfare, narrative warfare. They're the absolute progenitors. Chairman Mao was a master of this. Their propagandists are key. I mean, you can't even talk about 
the Great Leap Forward. It's just the uh, the three years of of natural disasters, right? Every every textbook and every history book in China, it's three years of natural disasters. It's very bad. Three years of natural disasters over and over and over. They're repeating these mantras that. And again, because of censorship, and we've seen the rise of censorship, you know, I, I don't even think you need to say it, right? You know, social media companies censor in the West the exact same way that they were taught to censor by the Chinese government, right? It's the exact same thing. Any narrative that doesn't comport, any piece of information that doesn't fit with whatever the, uh, you know, the affirmed story is, that's censored, that's wiped out, that's taken down. Well, so we're almost about out of time, but I think there's, to wrap this up, there's a very important um, theme that's been kind of running throughout this podcast, the idea of uh, how the 1% in the West cause sort of works with the Chinese Communist Party. You know, after the coronavirus, we have seen globally uh, a huge downshift in public opinion about the Chinese Communist Party. It seems like most of the people of countries around the world are increasingly cynical about the Chinese Communist Party. What can they do to shift the power away from this sort of 1% that still wants to continue to engage with China, the Black Rocks of the world still saying, now's the time to invest in Chinese bonds? Look, you know, that that's where I, I say to people like th this, is, this did not start overnight. It's not going to be unwound overnight. And there, there is no... Uh, you know, kind of magic bullet that gets you there. It is going to have to be a return, number one, to truth, to rationalism, and to understanding that you cannot go along with these globalized systems when you have bad actors like the CCP that are involved. And I, I want to be very clear that people need to understand it's not all of China, right? It's the 1% of China the same way it's the 1% of the West, right? We're talking about the 1%, the 99% of China, the Lao Baixing, the people that I met when I was over there, they're good people. They're normal people. They want to live their lives. They want to have jobs. They want to uh, want their kids to succeed. They want their kids to go to great schools. Just like everybody, they wake up, they go to work, right? They have uh, commutes, they have whatever they have. Just like everybody else, everywhere on the planet. The difference is in terms of what's going on with our ruling elites and their ruling elites. And so for Americans, I would say this is why the the ballot box is so important, but it's also why those economic decisions are so important, right? So uh, understanding where your finances are going. If you have a 401k, if you have an IRA that's tied up in this stuff, you need to start looking at that. You need to start asking, is this what I want? Is this where I want my finances? Um, if you are supporting somebody who's running for office, uh, you really need to start digging in on these questions, right? You don't have to be a China super hawk uh, or someone who's you know completely anti-Wall Street and all this different stuff to just have them start asking these basic questions of what's going on in terms of the U.S. overseas markets, why are we allowing these different trade deals to go on? Why are we allowing these things to happen? And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the term made in America has to mean something again, not just this assembled in America crap, not just this, oh, I'm so sorry that, uh, um, you know, but part of it was it was thought of in America, but it was made somewhere else. No. Make that mean something again, even if it means that something's going to, you know, a product is going to cost a little bit more money, but it was able to help a guy in Detroit and all the net benefits that come of that throughout the United States in terms of bringing these manufacturing bases and not even talk about manufacturing bases. Let's talk about the chip base, right? The fact that microprocessors and semiconductors are not made in the United States anymore. This is a national strategic emergency. It is an absolute crisis. Why do you think the China, uh, the PRC wants to take Taiwan back so much? Because they control 60% of the chip manufacturers in the entire world. And then you've got South Korea up with about another 15%. So boom, right there, 75% of microchips, processors, semiconductors that are being made in the world are right there. And believe me, the CCP absolutely understands that. This is a national strategic issue. Those are strategic assets. We need to start thinking in terms of what do we need as a country should something, uh, God forbid, one of these military crises uh, arise. And I'm not, by the way, someone who thinks that uh, 
you know, war is imminent with with China. Um, I certainly see the lines drawn. I certainly see uh, the threat. I don't think it's necessarily imminent only because they are trying, along with our one percent, to turn the and if you look at this in terms of the millennials and Zoomers and people that are coming up, they want you to be a renter class. They want you to be consumers. They don't want you owning homes. They don't want you owning, uh, you know, having stable jobs. They want you to be gig workers uh, who are renting, living out of apartment buildings or living out of homes that you don't own. So you're not generating wealth, that you're just consuming products again and again. You're uh, posting whatever they tell you. There's the latest fad on Instagram and social media, and you're changing your profile picture to include whatever, you know, whatever the new thing is, they want you watching TikTok, you are their customer, and they want you in that mode. And they want to be the ones profiting off of you, they want you to be serfs, they want you to be peasants. And so uh, Karl Marx, um, for many reasons was wrong, but he was certainly wrong in terms of this, because it looks like history isn't a cycle of progress, that in this case, You've got a country that, like China that went Marxist. You've got a country like America that went capitalist and, and freedom and embracing civil rights and human liberty. And now both of them are reverting back into what? A model of feudalism. This is neo feudalism that we're seeing. And that's and it's not like a it's not like a Republican Democrat thing. That's the real force you have to fight against.